it's such a great pleasure to be here. Um, I would very much want to organize the, or I would like to thank the organizers, uh, in particular for uh, accommodating this hybrid uh, model. I think it's for the first time for me that I participate in this really hybrid model, so not purely uh, in person, not purely uh, uh, virtual. So, so, so it's really uh, great. Uh, so thank you so very much for that. So today, um, what I'm going to present is joint work with uh, Rod Garrett from uh, UCSB. Uh, my name is Martin Van Oort. I work at the uh, Bank of Canada. Uh, and the views that I express today, they do not necessarily re reflect official positions of the, of the Bank of Canada. And the paper that I'm going to present is Why Fixed Cost Matter for Proof of Work Based Cryptocurrencies. Uh, and basically, um, just um, uh, zooming on, on what, zooming in on one question that the people uh, sometimes ask is, well, Bitcoin, is it viable in the long run or is it doomed to fail uh, due to double spending attacks? Um, so one of the things like like there's these miners, which basically uh, that, that keep the, the, the blockchain intact and they are incentivized by on the one end block rewards, so newly issued Bitcoins, and on the other end, uh, the transaction fees. Uh, but we know that as uh, Bitcoin slowly grows to its limit of 21 uh, million Bitcoins, uh, that, the, that the number of newly issued uh, Bitcoins per uh, block uh, declines. Uh, so people have been wondering, and it's really close to the question that Itai Abraham uh, asked this uh, this morning. Uh, basically, are miners in the future sufficiently incentivized to do the right thing? And uh, well, there are people doubting about that. So, so there's, for example, this paper by Rafa Auer, it's a BIS working paper, and it's actually a really nice paper to, to read, uh, especially in the context of, of the question was asked earlier in the keynote. So basically the paper, what the paper asks is when are miners incentivized to do the right thing? And basically from, from, from this uh, analysis, uh, the conclusion in this working paper is that simple calculations suggest that once block rewards are zero, um, it could take months before a Bitcoin payment is final, uh, unless new technologies are deployed to speed up payment finality. So, and then one might ask, well, are these double spending attacks just a theoretical possibility? Well, we know they don't. Uh, they, they, they do happen in practice. So for example, there was this Bitcoin spin-off, uh, Bitcoin Gold, um, that started as a, as an, um, uh, as, as a side, side chain of the, of, the, of, of the Bitcoin network in October 28, and they got attacked in a 51% attack in, in May 2018. And since then there have been many, uh, double spending attacks. So let's just zoom in for a moment uh, into uh, Bitcoin Gold. So Bitcoin Gold, it was born as a hard fork of the Bitcoin blockchain in October 2017. Uh, it used a proof of work uh, protocol that basically disabled the use of specialized equipment, ASICs for mining uh, operations. And it did so by using uh, a mining algorithm that was uh, believed to be or that was memory proof. So basically you could no longer use these uh, ASICs chips that were used to mine Bitcoin, uh, to mine uh, Bitcoin gold because they didn't have that uh, amount of memory. Um, so, uh, and the goal of this, uh, of, of this idea was to achieve a higher level of resilience through decentralized mining to more decentralized mining structure because we have seen with Bitcoin that uh, the mining structure has become more and more centralized. Um, now, only uh, t half a year later, in uh, May 2018, basically there were uh, several 51% attacks on Bitcoin Gold, and the attacker uh, double spent an estimated 80 million US dollar worth of Bitcoin Gold. And how did it happen? Basically, the narrative is as follows. So the attackers, they sent Bitcoin Gold uh, to exchanges. There they exchanged the Bitcoin Gold for other cryptocurrencies, which they withdrew from the exchange. and then. After that, they, they basically erased the initial transactions where they sent Bitcoin gold to the exchanges. They replaced them by other, uh, by, by other transactions. So now they held both these cryptocurrencies that they bought on the exchanges and also the initial Bitcoin gold. And basically that was a loss uh, to the exchanges. Um, and then uh, of course that, that led to loss of confidence in Bitcoin gold and a decline in the exchange rate. So currently, um, 
or at, at the moment when we wrote this, basically the exchange rate was only one sixth of what it had been at the time of the attack. And the number of Bitcoin gold transactions uh, to of Bitcoin transaction, Bitcoin gold transactions declined to less than a third what it was at the time of the attack. So basically here there's this chart with the Bitcoin gold exchange rate and you observe that it declined uh, um, after the attack, which is here on the horizontal axis at zero, uh, both in terms of Bitcoins and in terms of US dollars. So one key question is why was Bitcoin gold subject to a successful 51% attack while Bitcoin has not been? And a kind of a standard answer that people have in the back of their mind when you ask this question is, is often, uh, well, but nothing is, has as much computational power as the Bitcoin uh, network. Um, so that's really the fastest um, uh, to, to, to do these computations that you need to do to mine big Bitcoin, there's really nothing that can beat it. But what this answer is kind of ignoring is that the Bitcoin network is not one big thing in the sense that there are many different small actors within the Bitcoin network and they can make their own decision. So, so one, of, one of the things that we're wondering about in this paper is why, why does there not happen an attack from within the Bitcoin network? So why is there not a coalition of uh, miners that together do a 51% attack on the bit on the Bitcoin network uh, in, for financial gain. And basically we're asking under which conditions would it be profitable for them to do so? And it will turn out that the role of fixed cost in cryptocurrency mining is going to be crucial to answer this question. So it turns out that uh, actually the fixed cost of cryptocurrency mining, the cost that it takes to set up mining operations and to buy the hardware and the fact that you cannot really use this mining hardware for anything else, that that actually provides a protection against double spending attacks. Now, of course, we're, there, there's a, a quickly growing literature on uh, Bitcoin mining and double spending. Um, and uh, most of those papers, they consider the per period flow cost of mining, but not a fixed cost. So they only look at, for example, what you could consider as kind of the electricity cost uh, of mining. Uh, but there are two notable examples. So there's exceptions on this rule. So the first exception is that Eric Budish in his uh, paper that, that was issued in 2018, he, he provides a verbal discussion of what would happen uh, in his model uh, when you would introduce fixed cost. And it turns out that if you actually formally mo model uh, uh, the, the fixed cost and the alternative use value of mining equipment, that the results are actually really close uh, to his intuition. And secondly, there's a paper by Julian Pratt. I think he's in the audience today and uh, Walter. And uh, basically they uh, discussed the entry, this, they modeled the, the entry decision by miners uh, in the presence of fixed cost. Um, they don't model the implications for double spending attacks, but their estimates, the estimates in their model, they suggest that, that, that fixed costs, they are substantial. So they estimate them to be about two thirds of the total cost uh, of, of mining. So uh, in, in terms of the total cost picture, uh, fixed costs are really important. So what we do in this paper compared to uh, the rest of the literature is basically we'll incorporate fixed cost, the fixed cost of setting uh, up mining operation in basically in this, uh, in the question whether under which conditions a double spending attack should occur, could occur uh, or would be profitable. Uh, and basically let's, let me give you a quick summary of, of some of the theoretical results. So let us first look here at the column of where you only have variable cost. So there's this very quick economic result that if there are only variable costs, that basically miners earn zero income in equilibrium. And why is that the case? Well, in equilibrium, since there's free entry, anybody can join uh, for, for free. Uh, in, in the end, like quickly, uh, basically what will happen is that the marginal benefits should equal equal the marginal cost. And since there, and and when there are these only these variable costs, basically what, what will happen is that all the miners, they will earn a zero income in equilibrium. So what is the implication of that? Well, suppose now there's a drop in the exchange rate. Well, for miners, that's not a big issue because they were earning zero income in the first place. And for that reason, they had very little to lose. So they don't lose a lot of money as soon as the exchange rate drop. Okay, uh, for, for 
now the mining rewards they will be less than 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 the cost of running mining operations so some people will some people will quit uh, mining um, some miners will stop mining but but they don't lose anything in terms of of, of monetary value um, and then uh, a third implication is uh, basically if there are only variable costs basically basically what will happen and there's this really quick theoretical result is that the, the total amount of mining power will be proportional uh, to the level of the exchange rate so if the exchange rate drops by one percent basically mining power will drop by one percent um, and then uh, fourth um, well if you are a miner if you don't lose anything uh, if the exchange rate drops. So then you care less about the future of that coin. So you care less uh, whether, the, whether the exchange rate will drop, for example, as a consequence of a double spending attack. Uh, you will not lose a lot. So the cost of participating in a double spending attack are really low to you. So there's in, in principle a high willingness uh, to, 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 to join a double spending attack higher at least than in the case where there are fixed costs. So if you look at the second column, uh, well, if there are fixed costs, if you if you have to buy this equipment, if this costly to set up actually these mining operations, then miners don't earn zero income in equilibrium. Uh, basically in equilibrium, it will turn out that, they, that, that new miners will join until uh, the rewards that you get, the income that you earn is no longer enough to, to, to cover the cost of capital and or, or, or the cost to replace your hardware. Um, so in equilibrium, you, you will be earning a positive income. Like economists would say there would be zero economic profits, uh, but you're earning a positive income in the sense that, you, that you're still earning uh, the cost of capital. Uh, and so when the exchange rate drops, you're basically losing because now you, you're no longer able to make good on your investment. Uh, because now the exchange rate is lower and that's why the monetary rewards are going to be lower. Um, and um, as when you are a miner, if there, if there is this negative shock to the exchange rate, you, you will have an incentive to continue mining uh, because you still want, because perhaps your income dropped, but it dropped, it dropped by a little bit, but you would still make this positive margin, uh, which incentivizes you uh, to continue mining. Of course, not when there's a really big drop in the exchange rate, but for, but for smaller drops in the exchange rate. Um, and well, since miners lose when the exchange rate drops, that's why miners have an incentive. Uh, that, that's why, why they don't like double spending attacks, which can lead to uh, drops in the exchange rate. So double spending attacks are, are really costly in the presence of fixed costs to the miners. Um, and for that reason, it's less likely that the profitable mine is that, that, that the double spending attack is profitable to the miners. So um, uh, we also do in the paper, but not in this presentation, extension with cryptocurrency groups with transferable mining power. So in practice, you can mine different cryptocurrencies uh, with the same mining hardware. And it turns out the results are would be very similar if, if exchange rates go move perfectly, but of course they don't. Uh, and if they don't, uh, then that's in particular a problem for tiny currencies. So tiny currencies that have a low exchange rate correlation with their larger peers. Uh, in that, in such a situation, basically the transferability in mining power can eliminate, eliminate the protection that fixed costs provide. And basically the, the, the intuition behind the result is, well, there's all, even, even if this small cryptocurrencies, if the exchange rate would, would drop to zero, well, the miners, they still have this option to, to mine this bigger cryptocurrency. So the loss to them is not that big. And uh, empirical results, they provide supportive evidence of our theoretical results. So in this presentation, I'm not going to go through the entire, uh, all the math, but I just want to show you a few pictures. So. Here in this picture, you, you see uh, on the vertical axis, the mining power, the equilibrium level of mining power. Um, and on the horizontal axis, you observe a percentage drop in the exchange rate. So when, there, when the drop in the exchange rate is zero, the mining power is 100% of the equilibrium value. If the percentage drop in, in, in the exchange rate is 100%, then nobody has incentives to mine, uh, regardless of, of what type of hardware you're using. Uh, so the mining power will be zero in equilibrium. But then there's this threshold, which basically depends uh, on the hardware. And this threshold, it equals the difference between the fixed cost of installing your hardware uh, and its alternative use value uh, and uh, as a fraction 
of the total cost of using that hardware over the entire lifetime. So um, if you think about, for example, a situation where, uh, where, where you use general purpose hardware, where these are just cloud servers that you can use for any purpose, in that situation, you can think about this alternative use value as being really close to the fixed cost. So say it is close to zero. In that case, we are at the purple dashed line. And basically, uh, whenever any, any drop in the exchange rate, when the exchange rate goes down by 50%, mining power would theoretically drop by 50% as well. But in a situation where you use different types of hardware, so for example, take an extreme case, take uh, the SHA 256 uh, ASICs. In that situation, you cannot really use them for, for anything else than mining Bitcoin. Um, so you can think about this alternative use value as being really close to zero. So there will be this threshold um, value where um, basically where for, for small changes up to this threshold, for small drops in the exchange rate up to this threshold, basically it will have no negative impact on the level of mining power. But if it drops by more, then, then the mining power will start to respond. So we can quickly check this in an empirical model. Um, so of course there's these time series of the mining power, so the Q. So here we are estimating changes in mining power. Uh, and uh, on the on the on the right hand side here we have the change in the exchange rate. And you can think <coughs> about the change in the exchange rate like in the in a variable cost model where you just have the the the, the only thing that should matter for the exchange rate for the mining power today is the exchange rate today. Uh, and the rest should not matter. But we also included here the historical peak in the exchange rate. So changes in the historical peak. So there's basically two ways that you can think about this model. One is well if you only have variable costs, then the only thing that should matter is the exchange rate to the, today. So then only beta one should be relevant and there should be no uh, time dependence. There should not, sorry, there should not be any pot dependence. So it should not matter what the exchange rate was say a year ago. Um, that's one way to think about this model. It's a second way to think about this model is basically, well, we're allowing here the mining power to, to respond to changes in the exchange rate, uh, but we allow it to respond more to increases in the exchange rate beyond the historical peak, because then that's when you uh, might expect a larger adjustment in mining power. And basically, uh, in, under the situation where fixed costs are irrelevant, you would expect coefficient beta two to be insignificant. Now we can run that for several of the of the of the larger proof of work cryptocurrencies, and basically what you observe is that uh, this coefficient beta two uh, for the change in the log peak level, it's actually uh, quite significant for, for many of the cryptocurrencies, which is consistent with uh, a story for fixed costs. Then, um, well, of course, then, of course, a drop in the exchange rate still has an impact on, on miners. So, so when they, they, they continue mining uh, when they're when, uh, with ASICs, but, but there's a, a reduction in the, in the present value of continuing mining. So you can calculate like how much would they earn over, over the rest of the lifetime of their hardware um, if there's a large shock to the exchange rate. And that's what this picture is showing. Well, if, if, you, if your alternative use value is really close to your fixed cost, basically what you will do, if there's a really big drop in the exchange rate, you do something else with your hardware, but that has almost the same value uh, as, 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 a, as, as mining. Uh, so so there, that's not really a big, big thing. That's not a big problem. Uh, you can still get get your return on your investment. Um, but suppose you're mining with ASICs that you cannot really use for anything else. Basically, what you will observe is that the present value of mining will will drop considerably when there's a drop in the in the exchange rate, uh, and eventually will reach zero if the, if the drop in the exchange rate is sufficiently large. And basically, in this region, basically the the the, the value of continuing mining just matches your operating cost of the operation, say your electricity. So basically, if we then move to double spending attacks, well, if, there are, if, if you think about the double spending attack, there are two costs to the attackers. The first one is uh, the coins mined during the attack, they are sold against these, the lower exchange rate because you expect, you expect or you can expect that the exchange rate will drop uh, when a double spending attack uh, is revealed. Um, 
And secondly, uh, there is this uh, a potential lower present value uh, after an attack uh, of, the, of continuing mining. Um, so there's this lower present value of the, of the mining hardware, uh, which in particularly large for say uh, ASICs. So basically what you can calculate is you can, can from the theory, you can calculate from a formula like how, how many coins do you need to be able to double spend in order for an attack to be profitable. And in this table, we do it for, for a given set of parameters. And actually in the paper, we provide a table where people can look in their own numbers. And then it gives you uh, the number of coins that you would need to double spend for the attack to be profitable, uh, just in case you don't like our parameterization. But just for, for the parameterization that we, we've chosen in our paper, basically you observe here, uh, so, so let's take a look at panel A. So suppose you would have a 100% alternative use value so that you could use this hardware for any purpose uh, without loss in value and any alternative um, uh, um, purpose. And then suppose you would look at the drop in the exchange rate. Well, suppose you would expect that the exchange rate of Bitcoin would drop 30% after a successful double spending attack. Basically, in that situation, the attack would be would be profitable if you were able to double spend more than 146 Bitcoins. So that's a really low number. But now if you take into account the uh, potential fixed cost, basically you, you observe that this number increases quickly. So you easily get to a number that is more than a thousand times larger if you take into account um, the, the fact that uh, you cannot really use the Bitcoin mining hardware for other purposes than Bitcoin Bitcoin mining. Um, so because in equilibrium, these Bitcoin miners make a positive uh, profit uh, and they will, they will lose if there's a significant drop in the exchange rate, that, that is why they would need to double spend far more coins in order for an attack to be profitable. Uh, so it is less likely for a profitable attack to be feasible. Now, this is more the current situation. So there's kind of uh, block rewards plus uh, transaction fees of about slightly more than six and a half Bitcoins per block. Uh, but suppose we would go to a future where there's only a 0 0.42 Bitcoins uh, per block. So suppose where there's only transaction fees. So basically this kind of ha has been the, the average transaction fees over three quarters um, in 2019. Well, in that case, if you look at the numbers in the table, they drop considerably. So this is kind of this, what people are worried about, like this future scenario where there are only transaction fees and will this be enough to incentivize Bitcoin miners to do the right thing? Well, if there would be, uh, if there would be a 100% alternative use value or alternatively, if there were no fixed cost, basically they would need to double spend very few coins. So this is basically what the paper of Raffle Hour is warning for, for a scenario. And basically saying, look, you would only need to double spend, if, if the exchange rate were to drop 30%, you would only need to double spend nine Bitcoins in order for the attack to be profitable. Uh, but it turns out that if you actually take into account that uh, you can only use the Bitcoin mining hardware basically to mine Bitcoin, so the alternative use value is zero, uh, in that scenario, that, that number gets closer to 20,000. And suppose you would expect a higher exchange drop in the exchange rate. Of course, we don't know how much the exchange rate would drop, but if you would look at a scenario where you expect the exchange rate to drop by 60%, that number would be even higher. So you would be thinking about double spend 33,000 Bitcoins. And I leave it to your imagination whether that's feasible or not. Now, in the paper, we also discuss, uh, we also give, uh, discuss uh, a transferable mining power. Um, I'm not going to go into that uh, during this presentation, but basically what you get is uh, basically the, the, you give miners this option to mine other cryptocurrencies as well. And this is in particular an issue in situations uh, where there is where one of the cryptocurrencies is, is tiny compared to the other. So concluding remarks, well, accounting for fixed costs and alternative use value is crucial to understanding mining behavior and double spending attacks. Uh, second, uh, there is this basic truth uh, ASIC mining, which involves fixed costs and a low alternative use value, it reduces the profitability of double spending attacks. Of course, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have any other problems. There are issues uh, that were raised earlier today, for example, decentralization, uh, but it reduces the profitability and therefore the feasibility of double spending attacks. 
Third, uh, the investment in special hardware weakens doomsday predictions regarding the viability of Bitcoin. Uh, it seems that double spending attacks uh, are less likely to be uh, uh, profitable uh, if you take into account uh, the specialized hardware that is used in practice for mining, for example, Bitcoin. And uh, fourth, uh, but for that I refer more refer more to the paper, cryptocurrencies, they may be less protected when they don't rely on specialized hardware, or when they are tiny compared to peers that rely on the on the same hardware. And this is where I would like uh, to thank you for the opportunity uh, to present and also for everybody uh, looking at this presentation. Thank you.